I V M. The man once known as Siddhartha Gautama sits in a lush grove of trees on the outskirts of Sarnath, Isipatana, meditating. A gentle rain is falling. Birds huddle in the leaves. It is the height of the monsoon, when the rivers are in flood, when the rice is sprouting in the muddy fields, and the Indian subcontinent has come to a halt. Around Gautama are dozens of ascetics, all busy with their own thing. Some argue with each other. Others listen to lectures by older men. Others doze. Here, someone is blowing their nose. There, someone has gone off into the trees to relieve himself. Someone else sits and enjoys the fragrance of the rain on the earth. When we first saw Gautama, he was wandering alone through forests and hills. But now he has a few followers, a rather disreputable-looking bunch, all things considered. They wear little more than rags stitched together from what they have found on the wayside. Among them is Shorty, our frustrated friend from the first episode of this season. His head shaved, Shorty sits bowed, raindrops falling on his head. But he's smiling. He feels, for the first time in years, that he belongs here, like he's part of the world, not some insignificant bug dependent on the wealth and religions of the high and mighty. Gautama's face is utterly still and joyful, and he attracts more than a few curious glances from the other ascetics in the grove. Word of him is spreading. One day, a merchant's son, hungover and depressed, shows up and listens to Gautama in bleary-eyed shock. Then he goes away in tears and comes back with a couple of playboy-looking friends. Then they all go away and come back with even more of their pals and business partners, all with beautifully done-up hair and beards, their delicate face paints dripping down their faces as they listen to Gautama in awe, contemplating their lives and existences. They tell him they will follow him. They kneel in the mud, casting off their clothes and their jewels. They cut off their beautiful hair and beards. Come, monk. Ehi, bhiku, he says to each of them. Well taught is the Dhamma. Fair the great path for the utter ending of ill. And they come. In a month from now, when the rains have withdrawn from the Gangetic Plains, Gautama will leave this grove with dozens more followers. To the most senior among them, 61 in number, he says, You and I, monks, are freed from all snares, both those of the gods and those of men. Walk for the welfare, blessing and happiness of all. Teach them of the Dhamma. I will go to Uruvela, the camp township, and I will teach the Dhamma there. And they go. They walk through paths of mud and dust between endless fields, through thorny forests and steaming marshes, over hills and mountains. They must spread the word of the Blessed One and His Dhamma. As he walks, there is certainly peace in Gautama's countenance, but behind it lies a will of forged iron, as hard and determined as the mind of any king to be found in this vast land of forests and fields and farms and growing cities. It is the Iron Age of our world, after all, and Gautama has every intention of transforming it as much as any king or emperor. My name is Anirod Kanisetti. Welcome to Echoes of India, a history podcast. The events we've just witnessed come from the first book of the Mahavagga, or The Great Way, a Buddhist text compiled in the aftermath of the death of Siddhartha Gautama. 
I've compressed them, of course, but the basic story is the same. After he emerged out of the forest in the town of Isipatana, Gautama, the man we now call Buddha, rapidly began to attract a following among the sons of the city's wealthy merchants. And soon they began to fan out across the Gangetic Plains, spreading the word of his message. But as always, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than we might think. In the last episode of Echoes, we saw an India that was very different from the one that Gautama inhabits in this episode. Cities were only slowly beginning to grow. Merchants were around, but they weren't very wealthy or influential. The only texts that survived from that time were compilations by affluent Brahmins, and we used them to get a sense of a society that was gradually stratifying with much power concentrated in the hands of the uppermost castes. But now in Isipatana, where Gautama's journey as a teacher has just begun, there are dozens of wealthy merchants who are his earliest converts and missionaries. And more importantly, the groves outside Isipatana are full of ascetics, among whom only a few are Gautama's followers. And Isipatana is only one among dozens of towns where we know that ascetics were congregating at this time. For such a large population of people to be renunciants, Living off charity without really doing anything much in return implies that the economy of this time is rather more productive and complex than the relatively simple ones we saw in the last episode. So, what was this world that Gautama and his followers spread out into? Who ruled the vast expanses of the Gangetic Plains and how did the vast majority of people at the time actually live? How did Buddha manage to win followers for himself? And how on earth did this one man become so popular that his remains would be worshipped for over two and a half thousand years, right down to the present day? Well, let's descend from the heights of the Himalayas, swoop down through glacial valleys, fly over snowy peaks, follow the streams of icy waters, and follow the great river Ganga back to the plains of the 5th and 6th centuries BCE. The Iron Age in India is in full swing and the complex societies and religions of the late Vedic period, which we saw in the last episode, have begun a full-fledged agrarian revolution and a wave of urbanization. Archaeology from the time reveals all sorts of iron tools, plows especially suggesting that the land was being cultivated with an intensity that it had never seen before. Unlike today, economies are powered by primarily agriculture, and the most valuable lands are generally out in the open countryside rather than in cities. The wealthiest people control vast swathes of it. In contrast to the late Vedic period when much of this land was controlled by warrior clans, by the Buddha's time, or the early historic period, it is in the hands of upper caste householders, whose origins we saw in the lineages of the last episode. But just like today, there were a lot of people who didn't have land of their own or had land and couldn't afford plows and oxen to tend to it. Some of them went to newly emerging towns and cities just like they do today, but the vast majority of them were employed as laborers in the fields. They are probably, like Shorty, our irascible friend from episode 1, indigenous peoples who have to work in systems that were designed to make them do back-breaking work while funneling the profits to those who employ them. These Dasa Kammakaras, as they are called in Buddhist texts, were usually hired seasonally and were paid in nothing more than food, a miserable sour gruel made of broken rice. In comparison, the people who own the land and what it produces are vastly wealthy. We know of one Brahmin, for example, who had so much land that it required 500 plows to till it. This individual ownership is quite a contrast to the clan-based ownership that we saw during the Vedic period. We also see that, as before, kings are trying to establish their status and concentrate power by giving wealth to Brahmins. But that wealth was now in the form of land, not cattle or gold, as in the last episode. We also see lots of these landowners or householders in the kingdoms of Kashi, Koshala, and Magadha in the eastern Gangetic Plains. Remember those names because we'll hear from them very often in future episodes. These were also the most powerful and wealthy kingdoms of the early historic period, but this wealth probably came from granting land to upper caste householders and creating systems that allowed these householders to deploy cheap labor onto their fields. 
In his travels, Siddhartha Gautama often found himself interacting with these Brahmin landowners and these interactions could get rather heated. You see, Gautama's habit of converting people to his way of thinking, getting them to leave their households and follow him around begging for food in order to survive was a massive threat to this kind of economic system. But why was Gautama doing this? His philosophy was really simple. Forget about the complex metaphysics of the Upanishads. Humans suffer. Our lives suck. According to him, that's because we desire things. If we no longer desire things, we no longer suffer. And if you no longer want to suffer, you need to follow the Buddha and his teachings, the Dhamma. And Buddha thought that unlike the Upanishads or the secret doctrines, this knowledge should not remain restricted to those who could afford an education. Everyone could and should learn it, whether they were a Dasa or a Brahmin, irrespective of social or economic status. As you can imagine, that had a lot of appeal in an unequal and unjust system where people were often too caught up in their own business to just stop and enjoy the world around them. In one rather memorable instance, Buddha debated a young Brahmin called Ambattha and threw in his face the sheer inequality of the system they lived in. I would honor a Brahmin teacher who's sitting, but with shavelings. This is a disparaging reference to the shaved heads of renunciants such as the Buddhists. Shaltim preachers, menial black fellows. Here, Ambatha is using the skin color and occupations of people of quote unquote lower caste as an insult, something which sadly continues to this day. And the scrapings from my kinsmen feet. With them, I would talk as I now talk to you, Gautama. What do you think, Ambatha? Suppose a king standing on the foot rug of his chariot, should discuss matters of state with his chiefs. And suppose that as he left the spot, a slave stands on the same spot and discusses the same matter, saying, Thus and thus spake the king. Does that make him the king or one of his officers? Certainly not, Gautama. Aha! But just so, Ambatha, do Brahmins today chant and rehearse, intoning exactly as the ancient rishis uttered. Though you can say you know these verses as a pupil, how does that make you or any Brahmin a rishi or confer upon them the state of a rishi? Do you and your teacher, who parade about well-groomed and perfumed, hair and beard trimmed, adorned with garlands, enjoying the pleasures of the five senses, Do you live as the rishis did? Do you, eating boiled rice of the best quality, flavoured with curries, live as they did? Were they waited upon by women with girdles upon their loins? Did they drive chariots pulled by mares with plated manes and tails? Did they have themselves guarded in gated communities as you and your teacher do now? What Siddhartha Gautama is trying to say here is that the Brahmins of his day are immersed in the sensual pleasures of household lives, nothing like the sages or rishis of antiquity, whom he clearly looks up to. But in the process, he's also given us information about just how wealthy these landowners could be. They had retinues of bonded household workers, described in some sources as slaves. These people worked as woodcutters, water carriers, cooks, nurses, dancing girls and concubines. The householders also evidently had access to specialized craftsmanship. Someone had to make their chariots and the girdles for their slaves, make garlands for them and groom their hair after all. But we'll come back to all this later. Now, Kashi, Koshala and Magadha, with their high caste landowners tied to kings, weren't the only states in the Gangetic Plains at the time. These are states very much like the stereotype we imagine when we think of of ancient India, with a king at the top who was so holy and sacred and apparently just sat around giving free stuff to Brahmins. Remember that these originated in the relatively simple lineage-based territories called Janapadas, literally where the people have put their feet. We also saw that in some cases, these Janapadas evolved into Mahajanapadas, dominated by royal dynasties, whose status was supported through donations to and rituals performed by Brahmins. But just as in biology, a single organism can evolve into related but very different organisms, In human history, a single social system, the martial lineage-based tribe of the Vedic period, can evolve into related but very different kinds of state societies. 
While some Mahajanapadas saw power concentrated in a single family, other Mahajanapadas evolved into a fascinating concept called a Gana Sangha or Gana Rajya. Today, these are sometimes translated as republics. Of course, these weren't republics in the modern sense of the term, even though the Supreme Court in all its wisdom seems to think otherwise. These were in fact vast territories divided among members of a Kshatriya lineage, each of whom was considered a Raja or chief and had his own retinue of Dasas, craftsmen and Brahmins. Every year, these Rajas would gather in great assemblies where they would distribute the wealth generated by the lands they controlled among the entire lineage. One great confederacy called the Vrijis, a confederacy of eight clans, supposedly had 7,707 Rajas, whereas another, called the Chedis, supposedly had, wait for it, 60,000. These numbers are certainly exaggerations, but it's very interesting to think that systems with so many rulers actually managed to work. It also shows us that in ancient India, it wasn't just the Brahmin priests of the Vedas and the Upanishads that were capable of creating extremely intricate rules and procedures. So were other wealthy Indians of the time. Now, one of the clans that was part of the Vrijji confederacy was called the Lechavis. Do you remember that name? We saw them in season 2, episode 1 of Echoes, nearly a thousand years after the Buddha, when a princess of that clan became the mother of the great conqueror Samadra Gupta in a world totally different from the one that we're talking about today. But coming back to the Ganasangas, we have some hints of how they functioned. We know that in Vaishali or Vaishali, the main town of the Vrijji confederacy, there was a specially protected tank that was used for the consecration of the Rajas. The assembly of Rajas elected one individual called the Ganaraja or Pramukha as the president of their assembly with a vice president called the Uparaja. There were also specialized roles, generals and administrators, for example, who were responsible to the assembly as a whole. Quorums were needed, voting by proxy was permitted. In general, it seems that the older Rajas were allowed to speak first during debates. Resolutions before the assembly were moved, discussed and had three readings before being put to vote. These resolutions had some pretty interesting names, like Acts of Information, which were basically bulletins that messengers would go out and disseminate on behalf of the Ganarajya. Now, all of these probably sound very modern to us, but Ganasanghas and Ganarajyas were not exactly utopias. They were profoundly unequal places. If you weren't directly related to the main lineage from which the Rajas traced their descent, you had no place at all, even if you'd lived there for generations. Whether you were a Dasa or a Brahmin didn't matter. Only Kshatriyas had power in these confederacies. And these Kshatriyas were absolutely obsessed with lineage and purity. Here's what Buddha says about the origins of his own clan, the Shakyas, who were a minor Ganarajya in the Himalayan foothills. This is a quote from the Ambatha Sutta of the Digha Nikaya. Be warned, it's extremely weird, even if Buddha doesn't think so. Long ago, Ambatha, King Okaka, wanting to divert the succession in favour of the son of his favourite queen, banished his elder children, Okhamukha, Karanda, Hathinika and Sinipura from the land. And being thus banished, they took up their dwelling on the slopes of the Himalayas. And through fear of injuring the purity of their line, they intermarried with their sisters. Now, Okaka, the king, asked the minister at his court, Where, sirs, are the children now? And the minister said, There is a spot, sire, on the slopes of the Himalayas, on the borders of a lake, where there grows a mighty oak, a shako. There do they dwell. And lest they should injure the purity of their line, they have married their own sisters. Then did Okaka, the king, burst forth in admiration, Hearts of oak, Shakya, are those young fellows. Right well they hold their own, Parama Shakya. And that is the reason, Ambatha, why they are known as Shakyas. That's a pretty absurd and probably apocryphal story, more than a little reminiscent of a certain dynasty from a certain TV show whose name starts with game and ends with off thrones. But the myth still tells us something about how important lineage was to the Ganasanghas. But leave aside these rich aristocrats. Let's come back to the little people. 
Was life any better for workers, the Dasa Kamakaras in Ganasanghas? Nope. They had practically no status. In one instance, the Dasa Kamakaras of the Shakya and Kolya tribe end up quarreling over the irrigation waters of the Rohini River. But the real fighting is only done by the Kshatriya lineages who can defend their honor. And in the Vinaya Pitaka, a Buddhist text, there's one instance where humiliated Dasa Kamakaras decide to take revenge on their Shakya masters by attacking their wives and daughters when they're in the forest. This is one of the earliest records in India of women being the targets in a dispute between two groups. Once again, something else that continues to this day. So then, was Buddhism some kind of revolutionary workers' movement that helped liberate Dasa Kamakaras from their miserable material conditions and grant them dignity and status? I really, really wish that I could say yes. But with all things in Indian history, it's complicated. If you've spent any amount of time on the internet, you know the stereotypical story that's told about the life of Siddhartha Gautama. He is the son of a wealthy and powerful king who hears a prophecy that his son will either become a great ascetic or a great emperor. So the king tries to ensure that his son never sees suffering, surrounds him with pleasure, and never allows him to leave the palace. But Siddhartha sneaks out of the palace anyway, where he's tormented by the sight of old age, illness, and death, and finally inspired by the sight of an ascetic, and so he goes off and becomes the Buddha. The thing with the story is, it's mostly made up. Though there are references to the Buddha leaving his home in the early literature, the first full-fledged story of his life only emerges centuries after his death. In fact, the most complete record of it was written nearly 500 years after he died, in the Kushana Empire, a polity that he could never have imagined, which we visited in the first season of Echoes. But with all this being said, it's highly significant that Buddha, according to all sources, was a member of the elite of the Gangetic Plains, the son of a chief, one among the many Rajas in the Shakya Republic. And many of his converts, as we saw, were similarly elite men, usually from merchant, Brahmin, or Ganasangha backgrounds. Why is that? At the end of the last episode, we saw that the Upanishadic tradition and the social and economic structures it supported were already making some people leave their households behind to seek their own journeys to knowledge and enlightenment. Now, who do you think could generally afford to leave their homes without fear of their families dying without their labor. Well-off young men, that's whom. Fundamentally, these Enthu cutlets believed that following the system espoused by their fathers and grandfathers, study or apprentice under someone, get married and raise children, and then devote yourself to pieties and austerities was nonsense. And they took it upon themselves to leave their lives behind, gathering in small groups, wandering from place to place, performing all sorts of strange penances that they thought would offer them liberation from the world. In the beginning of this episode, we actually saw a bunch of those ascetics on the outskirts of Isipatana. These ascetics might follow dozens of different teachers over the course of a lifetime, interacting with other small groups and moving between teachers, depending on whose ideas appealed most to them at a given point in their lives. In fact, one of the major means by which Buddha managed to rapidly expand his footprint was by convincing these men that his teaching was a superior path to liberation, and then getting them to go out and spread his word to the general public. It's like nuclear fission, almost. A tiny impetus splits an atom which splits more atoms, and before you know it, there's an avalanche of energy and matter, the sort of massive explosion which always heralds a popular movement. Very often in ancient India, rapidly expanding numbers of Brahmin priests and Buddhist renunciants were competing for donations from the same agriculturists and wealthy households and they took food that could otherwise have been used to feed Dasa Kamakaras, the lowest among the low in the society of the early Gangetic Plains. A merchant in the Samyutta Nikaya, another early Buddhist text, says as much in this little dramatization. Oh, what have I done? I thought I could earn merit by giving food to these monks. But now the workers who depend on me to feed their families are starving. What is the merit in that? What have I done? So, how revolutionary, how people-friendly was Buddha, really? It's easy to see Buddhism as some kind of proletarian movement, but it's rather more complicated to see Buddhism as a system developed by elites to challenge the philosophy of other elites. For example, we saw Buddha criticize a Brahmin for his luxurious life a little earlier in this episode. But it's very interesting that Buddha didn't attack the original rishis at all. He only attacked the Brahmins of his day, 
whom he sees as living plump material lives instead of devoting themselves to the asceticism of their ancestors. Buddha had a big problem with the massive sacrifices and ostentatious rituals that had emerged by the early historic period and denounced them as made up by Brahmins to scam kings to earn wealth for themselves. But just because he was against some of the excesses of the Brahminical system and criticized its potential for true liberation, doesn't mean he necessarily set out to overthrow the entire system. He understood very well that inequality and suffering and the pursuit of pleasure were just a part of daily life for most people. And perhaps the only thing he could really change was to set social relations on a kinder and more ethical system of principles. Buddha, the religious figure, Buddha, the modern souvenir object, Buddha, the savior, Buddha, the hero of the downtrodden, all of these images we have of him are very different from the historical Buddha. We should not see him as a hero of our time, embodying our values and ideas, but rather as a man of his time. An extremely intelligent and empathetic man, for sure, but still a human being with his own biases, his own worldviews, his own cultural context, and his own failings. Anirudh, you absolute plate of mutton biryani, you must be thinking. If Buddha was so bad, why are you sitting and making podcasts about him? I know you don't have a full-time job anymore, but I do. So why don't you get along with it? What did Buddha really want? I hear you, my friend. Let me add a few questions onto yours. What exactly motivated Siddhartha Gautama to leave his home, his comfortable mansion with dozens of dasas, his status as a son of a Raja, and enter the forest? What gave this man the determination to seek some sort of fundamental truth about the human condition, and then spend the rest of his life wandering from place to place teaching, constantly debating, being attacked, gathering more and more people to his cause? What was he teaching that people even took him seriously at all? Why was he, among the dozens and dozens of squabbling teachers and sects of his time, transformed into a god, a religion, a symbol? The answer to that is that because for all the inequality of the system of which Buddha was a part, and despite the fact that he didn't seek to overthrow it entirely, he had some ideas of extraordinary clarity and humanity. We've already touched upon his thoughts about suffering and liberation and how everyone deserves to hear them, but that's honestly just the beginning. Remember the ideas of karma and rebirth that we saw the Upanishads developing in the last episode? Karma was a ritual action according to them. Only those who performed their karma with knowledge of the sublime universal principle, Brahman, could expect liberation or a happy rebirth. There was some conception that good behavior led to good rebirths, but those were just conceptions. They hadn't really developed into a solid system at that point. Now, along comes Buddha with this absolutely gobsmacking idea. Karma has nothing to do with ritual action at all. Karma is only ethical intention. If you do things with good intentions, you earn good karma. If you do things with bad intentions, you earn bad karma. Lots of good karma leads to good rebirths. Lots of bad karma leads to bad rebirths. It's as simple as that. It's as if all of a sudden, Buddha has come to the Brahmanical system and said, Actually, no. Left is right and black is white. Why is that? Let's take a step back and think about it. What does this mean? If expensive rituals and deep knowledge transmitted from Brahmin teacher to Brahmin student don't matter, if all that matters is wanting to do good, then there's no difference between any caste. All that matters is shared humanity, because anyone can do good or seek to do good. And even more earth-shakingly, if goodness is the measure of merit, if goodness is the guarantee that you will be reborn into better circumstances, then suddenly nobody has an incentive to give away their wealth for expensive rituals anymore. Everybody has an incentive to be good, to help their fellow humans. And since there's no single definition of goodness in any culture, you can take Buddha's basic ideas and apply them to any society and it'll still work. Of course, it's not enough to just have a brilliant idea that you think is going to benefit all of humanity, because if so, we would be worshipping everyone who smoked a joint and had a conversation or two in college. What makes someone a prophet as opposed to just another aging bag of meat searching for purpose is courage, conviction, their willingness to suffer for their ideas, and their abilities to challenge and convince those who have power. On all of those counts, Siddhartha Gautama towers over most of his contemporaries. But don't take my word for it. Here's an example of the man in action from the Asalayana Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya. 
At that point, Buddha was living on the outskirts of the bustling city of Shavatthi, the capital of the kingdom of Kosala and one of the largest urban centers in the Gangetic Plains. We are told that 500 Brahmins happened to have gathered in Shavatthi at the time and selected a bright young man called Asalayana, schooled in the three Vedas, with their vocabularies, liturgies, phonologies and etymologies, as well as the disciplines of philology, grammar and natural philosophy. These Brahmins told him, Master Asalayana, this recluse Gautama describes purification for all the four castes. Please come and dispute with the recluse Gautama about this assertion. Poor Asalayana refused twice, but finally agreed the third time he was asked. Then he went to meet Buddha and began to debate him. Master Gautama, us Brahmins say this. Brahmins are the highest caste. Those of any other caste are inferior. Brahmins are the fairest caste. Those of any other caste are dark. Only Brahmins are purified. Not non-Brahmins. Brahmins alone are the sons of Brahma, the offspring of Brahma, born of his mouth, born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. What do you say about that? How strange, Asalayana. We see with our own eyes that Brahmin women have their periods, that they become pregnant and give birth and feed their children from their breasts. And yet those who are born from their wombs say, Brahmins are the highest caste. Brahmins alone are the sons of Brahma, born of his mouth, heirs of Brahma. So what do you think, Asalayana? Have you heard that in the Yavana countries to the west, there are only two castes, masters and slaves, and that masters can become slaves while slaves can become masters? So I have heard, Gautama. Then, on the strength of what argument, on the support of what authority is it that Brahmins can say that they are the highest caste? The heirs of Brahma are the people of the Yavana countries, not people just like us. Now wait, answer me this. Let's say that a nobleman or a merchant or a worker were to kill, steal, rape, lie, manipulate. Would only such men reappear in an unhappy destination after death? Would a Brahmin who did these things be reborn into a higher place? That does not make sense. Of course, even a Brahmin who did these things would reappear in an unhappy destination. Then how is it that you say that Brahmins are the highest caste, the heirs of Brahma? Let's say instead that a Brahmin were to cherish living creatures, never steal, rape, lie or manipulate. Would only he reappear in a happy destination and not a nobleman, merchant or worker? Ah... Not at all, Gautama. All those who follow the path of virtue must reappear in a happy destination. I think. Very good. I have more questions for you then. Let us say, Asalayana, that a king were to assemble a hundred men of different births and say to them, Come, sirs, let any who are a Kshatriya or a Brahmin come and light a fire of sandalwood and produce heat. And let any who are born into an outcast clan, a trapper clan, a wicker workers clan, a cartwright's clan, or even a scavenger's clan light a fire made from a dog's drinking bowl, from a pig's feeding trough, from a dustbin, and light a fire and produce heat. Now tell me, would the fire of those from the first group have a flame, a color and a radiance suitable for heating and for lighting more fires? Of course, Gautama. But what is the point of this question? And would the fire lit by the second group have a flame, a color and a radiance equally suitable for heating and for lighting more fires? Yes, Gautama. All fire has a flame, a color and a radiance suitable for heating and for lighting more fires. So then answer me this now, Asalayana. 
Let us say that there are two Brahmin students, both brothers, born of the same mother, one studious and the other lazy. Whom would the Brahmins feed first at a feast? The studious one, Gautama. For how could something given to one who is not studious bring any benefit? But what if the studious one were immoral, and the lazy one were good and kind? Why then we would feed the kind but lazy one, Gautama? For how could something given to one of bad character bring any benefit? Ah, now Asalayana, let me summarize our argument. First, you took your stand on birth, and you agreed that Brahmins are not superior to any other human. Then you took your stand on sin and virtue, and you agreed that Brahmins are no different from any other. Then you took your stance on knowledge. the fire that anyone can kindle and use to brighten and warm and you agreed that brahmins are no different from any other and finally you yourself have agreed that it is not birth or knowledge that determines the value of a person but their kindness and their good intentions asalayana sits silent and glum for a few moments digesting what has just happened how deftly this man has dismantled his entire world view then as he realizes the implications he slowly straightens looking at the people gathered around him as though with new eyes and a smile warms his face magnificent master gautama magnificent i say i submit to your teaching From this day to my last you are my teacher and I your lay follower Did you see what Buddha did there the absolute mad lad He took every justification advanced in favor of caste hierarchy and turned it on its head and he subtly brought up his own theory of karma based on ethical intention using simple naturalistic examples that Asalayana simply could not disagree with Buddha was absolutely brilliant at doing this. We've seen in season 1 of Echoes how later Buddhists would continue this tradition of disputation which originated in a time and place so different from their own. Now, all this is just the beginning of our journey into the world that Gautama lived in though. We've talked so much about the Buddhists, but there was much much more happening in this world. Other groups that were taken far more seriously. There were tides of public opinion that could bring even Buddha to his knees. There were bustling marketplaces in new cities. There were kings, hard, bloody, ruthless, brilliant men whose struggles would end up shaping the subcontinent for centuries. And gradually, gradually, as Buddha wandered from city to city and his following grew from the dozens to hundreds to thousands, a new institution was taking shape. Perhaps among the most important conceptions in all of human history, this was the Buddhist Sangha or church or assembly. filled with ambitious individuals who just like ambitious individuals today cloaked their designs under the disguise of piety and renunciation hey hey thank you so much for listening to this episode of echoes of india as i'm sure you know the vast and complex history of south asia needs to be told through research empathy and good storytelling that takes time effort and a lot of thinking i'm doing indian history full time now Help me read, learn and write more about South Asia for you and for the generations that are going to come after us. Buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com/akaniactti to help support Echoes of India, a history podcast, Yudha, the Indian military history podcast, the Chola Bhatura Empire meme essay page on Instagram and Connected Histories, a YouTube channel dedicated to exploring how South Asia has shaped the world and how the world has shaped South Asia. It'll take 2 minutes of your time. You'll be helping me create some of the most accessible and easy to understand and critically researched content on South Asian history on the web, and you will have my everlasting thanks and gratitude. I know you'll help me out because you're awesome. There's a link in the description below. Go and click on it. And while you're at it, please support the IVM Podcast Network as well. Check out Yudha and other interesting shows on the IVM Podcast Network, on the IVM Podcast app, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey everybody, let me tell you a little bit about what happened on the IVM Podcast Network this week. 
we've had some amazing stuff, right? I mean, like, I don't know if you're aware of the redoing or the rebranding of the Traveling Professors show. We called it Now Smarter with Sid, which is our Deshmukh. This week, he examines Netflix getting into e-commerce, and will this affect how Amazon's dominating the space? Also, let me give you another quick hitch to join up on. So on Cider Says, Cider's was joined by Olympic equestrian Imtiaz Anis, and Nishan Burla from the Triangle Offense podcast showed up on Thursday's Cock and Bull to talk about the NBA Finals. On Nan Kari Sadaf and Arshiv were joined by Kesha Chaturvedi of the Theatre Mere Raste podcast. On Storytellers and Story Sellers, we need to talk to Ashim Mathur from Dolby. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram to keep up with what's going on on the network. And with that, let me also just finally thank our sponsors there, what makes things possible. We'd like to thank Seat, Cred, Global Victoria, Bank of Baroda, Intuit India, and Lenovo. Thank you so much for making this possible. From uncensored and unfiltered chats with the who's who of the entertainment industry, I, Siddharth Kanan, bring your very hearty chat show called Candid Kanan. Tune in every Friday on the IVM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts.